What's up, everybody, and welcome in to another edition of The Sit Down. As always, if you enjoy this video, please make sure you hit the like button and let me know what you think in the comment section below. Also, if you're new around here, you just haven't done it yet, or you're living under a rock, I don't know what you're waiting for. Hit that subscribe button below now so you never miss another sit down video. Today, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to get in to another mafia topic. And over the years, there have not been many more recognizable faces in the American mafia than Carmine Jr. Persico. He was the poster boy, the Colombo crime family, really from the late 60s to present day. He had many family members that would be involved in the mob, including his son, brothers, and cousins. One of his most trusted family members was his first cousin, Andrew Russo. Russo passed away last week, April 20th, 2022. And I found it important to talk about him today and about his life. We hear a lot about Carmine and Little Alley Boy and Teddy. But what about Cousin Mush? The story of Mush Russo next. On sit down shorts. Andrew Russo was born in 1935 in Brooklyn, New York. He was actually the first cousin of Carmine Jr. Persco. Now, many will say, well, his nickname was the Snake. That's true, but you would never call him Snake to his face. To me, a nickname is something that people agreed to call him and regularly called him. Many people would call Carmine. Junior Persco. That was his nickname. Now, you can call him the snake because let's remember he was a snake. But Andrew Mushrusa would really be able to ascend in the Profaci and into the Colombo crime family under the tutelage of his cousin. Now, uh, early on for Mushrusa, it was really his earning that started to get him a lot of respect. By 1968, at age 33, it was alleged that Mushrusa had a gigantic a Shylocking operation. He was giving out tons of loans throughout the city of New York and on Long Island. And he had amassed a very big loan book. It was also uh, discussed in the late 60s that Mushrusha was also really muscling in to carding companies. As we know, garbage has always been a big moneymaker for the mob. And for the Colombo crime family, Mushrusha throughout his life was integral in not only garbage, but trucking companies. He would actually own a company called A&S Trucking, and that would allow him, by, again, his mid-30s, to amass a lot of money. He actually would buy a very plush a palatial estate on Long Island, and he would live in Long Island, on Long Island, his entire life. He was living the good life as an earner. He had high-up connections in the family. And by the early 70s, as we know, the Colombo crime family has always been immersed in a bunch of nonsense. They would have the wars involving the Gallows and Profacis. They would have the stuff down the road with Arena and Persco. And during the early 70s, once Joe Colombo is shot, Carmine Persico slots right in as the new boss of the Colombo crime family. But by 1973, Persico, who, as we know, faced a lot of jail time in his life and really wasn't on the street very long. In 1973, Persico gets hit with a hijacking and loan sharking charge, and he would get not one but two sentences that would basically make him do over a decade in federal prison. And for Mush Russo, this is where he'd be called on. Now, it wouldn't be until 1976 when the books would reopen. Now, when I say books reopened, in 1957 – after the disaster that was Appalachia, and the mob commission and brass really banded together behind Carlo Gambino to close membership. And Mush Russo had to really wait for about eight years from the late 60s into the mid-70s until he would be made. In 1976, the books would open back up and Mush Russo would be called upon. He would be made member of the Colombo crime thing. Now, he wouldn't have to wait very long to get his own crew. In 1978, he would get his own crew, and that would be great news for the man they called Mush. He was making a lot of money. He was in control of a lot of Carmine Persico's rackets. He could be trusted. He was the first blood cousin of Persico. And as we know with Carmine Persico, this is something that in the end did Carmine Persico in. His obsession with his family members and keeping them in power led to his downfall, but it also allowed him to run the family for a long 
period of time. Now, during the 70s, Mush Russo was not only very well known in the Colombo crime family, but he was starting to meet a lot of very powerful people. According to mob rat Jimmy the Weasel Fradiano, seen here on the left, uh, right uh, with uh, crooner Frank Sinatra, he would discuss that in this photo, this was actually taken at the Rainbow Room in New York City. Sinatra held a private concert that night for a bunch of hobnob mobsters, and they palled around and had drinks and discussion and all sorts of different things. Fradiano would discuss that that night he would be introduced to Mush Russo by acting boss Tom DeBella. DeBella would introduce Mush as kind of Carmine's cousin and his overseer of a lot of his racket. So he was meeting people in high places. This is also where he would be introduced to new e Northeastern boss of Pennsylvania, Russell Buffalino. Now, Mush had a very good mind, and the bread idea came to, hey, let's extend some of our operations into the Poconos. And he would continue that relationship with the bosses of Northeastern Pennsylvania, really into the 90s, which we'll get into. The one thing about Mush Russo that I have to say, very smart individual, good earner, had the leadership qualities, and this is why he would continue to ascend. Not only did he have Carmen Persico as a family member, but he was a smart individual. Uh, Russo always was smart when it came to earning, and he was able to take this family really through some tough times, and really at the end was the last man standing. Mush Russo, uh, as I said, in 1978 would become a COPPA regime, and he would take over a lot of Junior's involvement, as I said. Now, one thing he would do as well that would be a major problem for not only himself but for Junior Persico, he would come into contact with an individual called Victor Puglisi. Puglisi was a restaurant owner in Long Island, and Puglisi would go to his friend Mush Russo, and he would say, listen, I got this rogue IRS agent that's on the take and he can get Junior moved from the South in prison up to New York. And, you know, obviously his cousin was his overseer, did a lot of things for him. He thought, well, this seems like a good idea. Let's dull him off a little money. He can get Junior a lot closer. And he would also contend that he could probably get Junior Persico out of prison. Now, the mob's ears perked up. Mushrusha thought, I'll be a great cousin and I'll get... Uh, him out of prison. The problem was, ultimately, it was talked about that that IRS agent, Richard Anicharico, was actually a double agent for not only the FBI, but for the IRS. And he would basically use the mob and get all sorts of great info. And we would almost liken this to the Donnie Brasco situation. Mush was the individual that vouched for Puglisi and this idea. Now, you'd have to wonder, how did he never get disciplined for all this? And the FBI, through all this, the IRS would also learn of different things Mush Russo was involved in. Through Anichirico, they would get uh, several wiretaps. They would also uh, view uh, the Colombo crime family, men, many of the brass in the Colombo crime family, in Las Vegas at the fight of this individual, Vito Antoafermo. Antoafermo was an Italian middleweight boxer that many would actually argue Mush Russo had some ownership in. Michael Franzese actually talked about this, and there was a lot of reason to believe that Mush Russo was making a ton of money off fixed fights and things of that nature. Um, and this is something that the FBI would almost kind of witness when this Nicharico stuff happened. But ultimately for Carmen Persico, he was not going to get out of jail. In fact, he was going to get a longer jail sentence and he could thank his cousin, Mush Russo, for that. Now, in February of 1980, the hammer would drop and the Columbo crime family would find out that they didn't exactly have an IRS agent on the take. It was actually a rogue uh, agent who was playing them. Now, interestingly enough, Victor Puglisi, the individual that introduced everyone together here, miraculously disappeared around this time, and he was never found. On November 7th, 1980, Carmine Persico... Uh, would be arrested on this case. And for Mush Russo, he got the picture and went on the run. He, alongside Persico bodyguard Hugh McIntosh, would head out of town and uh, try to go on the run. Um, in 1981, though, Mush Russo, after about a year on the run, decided, I'm not going to run anymore. He would surrender uh, to the FBI, would ultimately get five years for bribing an IRS agent. Uh, in this case for Mush Russo, it wasn't a big problem because by this point, he had introduced his sons 
uh, to the life, JoJo and Billy, they were involved. And he would also put most of his rackets while he was inside in control of his nephew, uh, Chucky Russo, who was also involved in the Colombo crime family. So for Mush Russo, it really wouldn't miss a beat. But this would start a long line of prison stays for Mush Russo. And something that we would learn about the Colombo crime family, they spent a lot of time in prison. And Mush Russo was no different. Now, ultimately, uh, he would uh, get out uh, after just a couple of years inside. And Mush Russo would have really a welcome home party. He still was making a lot of money. Uh, with different mob rackets. He was, as I said, very involved in the carding industry. And now his sons are involved in the life. He was a happy man. Uh, he was in control. Uh, he would get out, though. The problem was for the Colombo crime family, like many families in the mid-'80s, they would face major indictments, as we know. Uh, in 1984, a 51-count indictment would drop on not only Mush Russo, but Carmine Persico and the upper echelons of the Colombo crime family. Russo was only out a year or two. He'd get right back in. He would be arrested around that time. And this would, again, Persico would take a page out of Russo's book and decide to go on the run. And this would create another problem for Mush Russo. It was alleged that Mush Russo was actually the individual that would connect Fred to Christopher, a cousin of the two, and say, hey, Junior, Go hide out at Fred Christopher's house on Long Island. Everything will be fine. That's my relations. Everybody's good. Everything's going to be fine. So Persico gets that news. He heads out on the run and becomes a wanted man by the FBI. The good thing for Mush Russo is he's actually released on 500K bail in this big indictment. This was going to be a big problem for the Colombo crime family, as it was for a lot of the families in the 80s when all these different hammers would drop by the FBI. Now, as we're kind of in this period where Russo is out on bail, Purse goes on the run. I want to talk a little bit about Mush Russo and a fascinating story that I would find. Um, and this would come um, courtesy of the ColumboMafia.com. They would talk about a fascinating story that a few days after Mush Russo is released on $500,000 bail, Mush Russo had a boat and enjoyed boating. He loved cooking. He loved spending time with his family. He lived on a sprawling acreage out on Long Island. He would take his wife and granddaughter on a little boat ride uh, on the Great South Bay in Long Island. And this is where Mush Russo actually became a bit of a hero in his great uh, head or on his um, old Brookville, Long Island uh, town. He would actually be in the bay during that time in October of 1984, where he would spot two fishermen's boat who had capsized in the Great South Bay. Mush Russo, the hero that he was, jumped into the Great South Bay and saved both fishermen, a story that we don't hear much about the mafia, something good that they actually did. Uh, Mush Russo was credited with saving those individuals, um, and he could have that on his uh, not so. How do we? How about that? He did a little good. So the government releasing him was actually good because he saved two fishermen. So how about that? Uh, we don't see here or hear that stuff much uh, in the mafia. Now for Junior Persco and for the Colombo crime family, the hammer would drop because eventually the FBI would find out that Carmine Persco was hiding uh, at uh, Fred De Christopher's home, and Fred De Christopher decides, you know what? I'm just an insurance salesman. I don't want to be hemmed up with the mafia. I'm going to testify alongside the IRS agent and other people who had flipped against the mafia. Now, for Mush Russo, he would have all sorts of problems. According to the terrific book, Five Families by Selwyn Rabb, in that book, he would discuss a conversation between Fred De Christopher and Mush Russo. Russo, at one point, would tell De Christopher, quote, see, Freddie, if they fear you, They'll lick your hand or kiss your feet. They'll respect you. I'm a gangster. See, Freddie, I can lie and I can cheat and I can kill. A lot of that stuff did Mush Russo in. And look, this stuff is problematic for the mob. You just can't talk around that kind of stuff, do the type of things you do, and not expect it to come back and bite you. And look, the hammer would ultimately drop on Carmine Persico. He would get a 100-plus-year sentence for these 
of pieces of work. And this would really end the reign of Carmine Persica. It wouldn't end his reign as boss because he'd continue to be boss behind the wall. But the hammer would drop on multiple members uh, of the Colombo crime family. Jerry Lang would be named in this. He would get 65 years. And for our subject today, Mush Russo, he would head back to prison for a long sentence. He would get 14 years behind the wall. And for the Colombo family, pretty much everyone went away. Everyone in the higher end leadership went away. Now, a couple of people stayed on the street, and this would create the next Colombo War. Vic Arena would be instituted as acting boss, and this was really to keep the seat warm for Persco's son, little alley boy Persco. But Arena gets the idea and says, look, I'm not fucking leaving. I'm the boss of this family now. I control things. I'm not going to go through the entire Vic Arena, Carmen Persico War, but as we know, throughout the early 90s, Bodies were dropping all over the place in the Colombo crime family. As we know with Mushrusha, though, he was locked up. He would get out in 1994, and he would come home as pretty much one of the only people left on the streets. And the thing for Mushrusha, though, was we have to give him credit. Vicarain is gone. He kind of comes out and says, you know what? The writing's on the wall. Persicos are in jail. I'm the cousin. I'm next in line. And he basically is instituted as the boss of the Colombo crime family. And for the Colombos, we finally see a bit of calm waters. In Mush Russo's case, he loved boating. He has some calm waters finally. And that was big for him. He comes home from prison. A lot of people are gone. He says to the people remaining on the streets, arena loyalists like Joe Waverly and people like that, he says, look, let's have a peace agreement here. Joe Waverly, you could become underboss. Everybody's happy. Let's get back to start making money again. And for the, at this point, there was still money to be made on the streets. Mush Russo takes control. He operates out of a social club in Park Slope, Brooklyn. He elevates certain people in the arena faction. And everything seems to be riding the ship. He wants the Colombo crime family to start being recognizable again. And that was big because they were off the commission. They were not trusted. The Arena War uh, was all sorts of bad publicity. And what he does well is he goes to old connections that he has and starts to pacify things. It was alleged that he had multiple meetings uh, with different members of the mafia during that time. Uh, and this is something that was needed because this family needed some consistency. They needed to be in the eyes. They needed to be out there earning again. He would meet members of the mafia, including Northeast Pennsylvania boss, Big Billy D'Elia. It was alleged that in the mid-90s, he would meet Philly boss Ralph Natale up in Brooklyn. He was trying to make connections to get this family back into the scheme of things again, kind of the way Joe Messino was able to do once he took over in the 90s and really taken the Bonanno family from a non-respected entity to one of the most powerful th families. The problem for Mush Russo was the jail bug would catch him again. In 1996, late that year, the hammer would drop where he would be involved in a big 31 count indictment involving the trash industry. He had a man in control on Long Island called Dennis Hickey. And he was acting really as a mob uh, infiltrator who was basically telling different carding companies, you fucking get down or lay down with us or you're going to have to deal with the Colombo crime. It's just a big indictment that involved the takeover of the trash industry. And for Mush Russo, he would again see the back of a jail cell. He would get a long prison sentence uh, in 1999 and really wouldn't return home until the early 2010s. And for Mush Russo, this was the end. He just couldn't recognize it. Mush Russo comes out. And as we know, we can say this about Mush Russo. He was a stone cold gangster at the end of the day. He didn't know anything else. It's not like Mush Russo is going to get out of prison in the early 2010s and say, hey, I guess I'll go be a dentist now. All he knew was the mob. And even though it was a shell of where it was 10 plus years before, what he starts to do is he gets Vinny Asaro syndrome. And when I say Vinny Asaro syndrome, these guys know nothing else. They know nothing. They start palling around with people that don't have the same balls as the people they were around before. They start trying to connect things that really just shouldn't be connected. And they start doing things and going off half cocked and they get themselves in trouble. And that's exactly what happened to Mush Russo. He was a gangster through and through, but some of his connections really started to give him issues. One of the connections he had made really had happened early in his life. And some of the interesting connections that Mush Russo had were celebrity connections. 
it was very well known that even during his 80s trial involving the Colombo crime family, not only was James Kahn, the actor from The Godfather, there to support Mush Russo, a boyhood friend, but he was actually very close with Carmen Persico as well. Mush Russo uh, had friends in high places, and James Kahn had really been his friend since they were kids. Kahn would talk about the fact that he had no idea that Mush Russo was a mobster. He was a great grandfather and a great father, and he would show many lines of support to his friend for many years. And even up to his death last week, uh, the Kahn family would talk very regularly about Mush Russo. One of the connections also that Mush Russo had was to this individual, Federico Castelluccio, also known as Furio from The Sopranos. And I've talked about this in a past video. It was alleged that after The Sopranos ended, Furio decided to take some of his actor money and put it into a restaurant. He would partner with a New Jersey restaurateur to create a restaurant in North Jersey. The restaurant went belly up about two years later, and Furio wanted his money back. He had actually met Mush Russo as Mush was serving a prison sentence. Furio came to visit a friend. He took a liking to Mush, and they became friends. Through one person or another, uh, it was alleged that on wiretap, uh, Mush Russo would tell mob rat Anthony Russo that, quote, we need to get Furio from the Sopranos money back. He would tell him that he was a friend of his and that Furio wanted his money back. Now, Furio's attorney would say uh, a year or so later that Furio had no OC connections and that, um, that he didn't even know this conversation took place and that it was just a civil matter. Uh, but this is something that would pop up after Anthony Russo would actually uh, turn government witness. I'm not going to go into Anthony Russo's story. I've talked about him in the past involving his connections with Teddy Persico. He was involved with the murder of Joe Scopo Jr. Russo would turn government witness. And this is a problem because Russo is starting to trust people like Anthony Russo and, and people that really just didn't have the stones like the guys that he knew many years before. Ultimately to present day, Mush Russo had been the boss of the Colombo crime family, according to the FBI, really since uh, the mid-90s. He had a long reign, and as official boss, he had been official boss for about 10 years. It was up until 2021, in September of that year, Mush would face yet another indictment. The FBI would bring a large indictment against what was left of the Colombo crime family in September of 2021. And what we see in the leadership chart of the Colombo crime family is they're just hanging on by a thread. Upper echelons of the Colombo family outside of Mush Russo were mostly recognizable. Ralph DiMatteo, Benjamin Costalzo, a lot of these guys were lower end individuals, but at high tier positions. This really showed us what the Colombo crime family was. Mush Russo would actually get a $10 million bail in early 2022 after it was alleged that he had many health problems according to his lawyer, Jeffrey Lichtman. As I've said, on April 20th, 2022, uh, about a week ago, Andrew Mushrusso would die at the age of 87 years old. Uh, he is survived by many children and many grandchildren. And they, at his funeral, would talk very glowingly about the grandfather and father they knew. Most of the grandkids, they didn't do anything wrong here. They loved their grandfather and they would call him Poppy. Uh, they would talk regularly about the meals that he made and the great times that they had. But one thing we can say about Mush Russo, he was a gangster through and through. And in the end, he just couldn't recognize that it was maybe just time to take a break and walk away. The good thing for Mush Russo, though, is he wouldn't die in a prison cell. He would actually die in his own bed. I want to leave you uh, with a quote straight from Andrew Mush Russo's mouth. And it really anchors the sentiment of not only the fact that he was in charge, but this is all that he knew. According to a 2010 wiretap conversation, when asked about retiring, Russo would say, quote, I can't walk away. I can't rest. He was a gangster. That's all he was. And at the end of the day, that's what the Persicos were. We can give them credit. At the end of the day, they held tough to who they were gangsters until the end. As always, if you enjoy this video, please hit the like button. Let me know what you think in the comments below and make sure you subscribe so you never miss another sit down.